Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining today's interaction. My name is Seema Menon, and I'm the director and COO at CFO Collective, the organization that owns the CFO India brand, which is a leading media platform focused at engaging the CFO community in India. Uh, in today's interaction, we're going to talk about what are some of the key trends in data and analytics that are impacting the office of finance, the automation of business processes, and the upskilling of people for quick wins and transformative outcomes. This is our third session uh, you know, in the series that we are running uh, around analytics. And at each session, we've explored different aspects of how analytics is sort of contributing to the business agenda. Uh, we've looked at how it's impacting finance transformation. So today we will talk about, uh, you know, how organizations are leveraging analytics very successfully and uh, get our panelists to sort of share some of uh, their experiences using intelligent uh, analytics. So without any further ado, I'll uh, get started with our interaction today. I'm delighted to welcome our esteemed speakers for today's interaction. We have with us Dev Tripathi, Director of Finance for Philips uh, Healthcare in India, Prasad Dungadi, Director of Finance for Yahoo Inc., Manish Oja, CFO of Amul Dairy, Nipun Bansal, Head CX, Finance India for Nokia Network Solutions, and Sachin Kataria, Analytics Evangelist for Alteryx. Thank you all for joining us today. Before we get started with the discussion, just a little housekeeping announcement. So if you have any questions uh, during the course of the interaction, please type them into your Q&A window, and I will bring them up during the question and answer schedule at the end. Uh, we will also run a few polls during the course of the interaction. So. Uh, this is a slide which uh, will uh, help you understand where you need to key in the uh, responses. So with that, we will get started with, uh, uh, with Sachin. Sachin, just give us an overview around, uh, you know, intelligent analytics and how is it different from uh, business intelligence or solutions that we've seen uh, earlier. Okay. Right. Thanks, Seema. So, um... See, I'll try and keep it very simple. See, the entire idea is that, you know, analytics has been around for centuries. Okay? Centuries is the word here. It's not just one recent phenomena. It just happened to be done differently in different time periods. Uh, if you look back, even way back in World War II, Winston Churchill used a kind of analytics to win the war of Britain. And uh, it was all based upon the same thing that it's based on now. It's based on data. So the idea here is that the more data you have, typically means the more opportunities you have to analyze it and therefore derive insights from that. Okay? Now, we know that how the data explosion has happened in the recent years, right? We're pretty much doubling our data at a certain frequency, which is, you know, unprecedented at this time, which means that we've got a lot more data with us, uh, both in structured and in unstructured form, uh, than we're able to make use of. What if we were able to unlock that? If you were able to derive insights from that massive amount of data that's at our disposal and be able to then use that to make better decisions. That's the whole crux of intelligent analytics. So it's still this traditional analytics is still there. Intelligent analytics just augments it through the use of what we of tools that we now have at our disposal in the, for example, AI ML. Okay. So when we have an AI ML program or an AI ML bot that's doing that work, that uh tedious work of data churning to be able to figure out, identify patterns, and then report it back to us, which we can then use to derive insights and then make better decisions. That completes the entire cycle of intelligent automation or intelligent analytics as such. So the way it differs from business intelligence is that business intelligence was predominantly manually driven. You depended upon a team of people who would then sit there and try and sift through that information. Obviously, they'll do a sample because nobody can churn the ocean. And based upon that limited amount of data that they would analyze, they would come up with certain insights and then share that with the rest of the community. And a lot of bias may also be brought into it as a result because it depends upon the skill and the intelligence and the biases in inherent in human nature to be able to do that sort of analysis. But when you put in an AI ML system in place or a tool uh, into place for that, then it eliminates those biases as well. Then it's purely driven by the data. It's purely driven based upon patterns that it finds in the data and it learns accordingly. And that's where the intelligence comes from. 
So, uh, you know, thanks for giving us that perspective, Sachin. Um, I wanted to just quickly poll our audience to understand, you know, what are some of the key drivers for building an intelligent analytics uh, capabilities within their organization? So um, I have a poll active just now, and I would just request you to key in the responses quickly. So what are some of the key drivers for building? for building an intelligent analytics capabilities within your organization. So it's a multiple choice. Um, we can choose the top three. Poll will be active for the next 10 seconds or so. So request you to quickly key in the responses. Okay, so interesting, we have about 81% say that improved forecasting and decision making and uh, cost reduction and efficiency improvement so these two are you know the key criteria or drivers uh sachin very quickly does this sort of resonate with your clients as well absolutely absolutely see um all of these are key drivers firstly right okay? but in terms of you know what typically drives the dollar Right. Right. So when you're talking about cost reduction, efficiency, efficiency improvement, that pretty much drives almost every effort across every enterprise, every industry, every vertical. And right. so that's talking about the bottom line. Now, when you talk about the top line, that's where improved forecasting and decision making comes into place because you want to see what are the kind of, uh, you know, what are the opportunities that I can now take advantage of, which I couldn't earlier? What are the opportunities that I'm missing out, which I didn't even know about earlier? So that's where improved forecasting helps you with doing better decision making. So the top two is not a surprise at all. It's something that we've seen uh, as a recurrent theme in most of our uh, initiatives. Right. And also, I think, uh, you know, some of these drivers or compelling reasons will sort of change if I query a different set of audience, which is, you know, maybe the CMOs. Uh, yeah. or the chief operating officers for that matter. Yeah. I mean, the the uh, the percentages may vary, but broadly, I think this is these are the objectives that they are trying to yes. uh, sort of achieve. Okay, sure. great. So with that, we'll move to our uh, next poll, which is around what factors would you prioritize when planning to incorporate advanced analytics in your organization's decision-making processes? So we'll quickly move on to our next poll. Okay, 30 seconds. Request you to key in your responses quickly. Okay, I think, you know, 100% of our uh, audience has said alignment with business strategy and goals. And I think this is true for any transformation exercise that you would undertake. I mean, it has to align with the company's uh, organization's agenda, strategy and goals for that matter. And uh, Sachin, again, uh, this sort of resonates with, with what your clients Absolutely. Do, right? Yeah. See, um, no initiative ever meets the approval because, of mm. course, there's going to be an investment here, right? And the investment will always be measured against the, uh, you know, whether it is aligning you or helping you uh, achieve certain business strategies and goals. Unless that's true, it's never going to uh, be approved in any case. Yep. The rest of it in terms of technical expertise, data ownership access, those are all hygiene factors that are you know they come into play post launching this initiative yes. but the key factor is yes of course alignment and and what's interesting to note is that collaboration and communication across departments i think you know from a finance standpoint this becomes so much important because uh, finance is the fulcrum you know of the organization and you need to interface engage with with different departments and analytics sort of facilitates that uh, that agenda of the finance organization, which is quite uh, uh, interesting to know. Um, okay, now with that, we will move to uh, Nipun. Uh, Nipun, as a as a practitioner, you know, we've looked at what are some of the key focus areas 
uh, for uh, businesses when they are looking at embarking on initiative like this what are some of the priorities that they need to keep in mind so uh, tell us with, uh, you know give us your perspective uh, saying that what are some of the key focus areas for cfos when they're defining the analytics agenda for the finance function yeah thank you seema i think you stole a lot of my answers through your phone <laughs> all of the answers were taken off by sachin but then uh, i think we've been talking a lot of analytics agenda so what basically this analytics agenda means uh, is also important to know see it is something driving the data which is driving your strategic plan right. outlining your goals your objectives you using this data analytics thing for your decision making process so this is something we define as the analytic agenda now coming back to your question that what are the key focus areas as a cfo which i would need as sachin very rightly said that data has been there for years and we've been hearing this term that data is the new oil and i can tell you this oil is greasing our machinery very well and is running mm. our running our machinery these days very well we have a lot of bi reports we have a lot of automated reports and just a while we were talking of all this ai is which is happening but the first and foremost area to me which is of importance is the data itself yeah. the quality of data when i say quality of data i mean to say data governance and quality is the first most important facet yeah. our focus area from my side to be taken care of and when i say that which means establishing a robust data mechanism or the governance policies around that would ensure that the data quality standards are met mm. we use the term ego which is garbage in garbage out but if those data quality standards are not met whatever kind of analytics tool we develop mm. the output would be incorrect and if the output is incorrect the decision making would be incorrect so that the first and most important facet to me which which is second would be the business intelligence as i call it bi and reporting the focus of the cfo should be on implementing the business intelligence tools and dashboards which should provide the real time uh, insight into the financial performance and when i say real time insight into the financial performance we sit at certain times such a situation where we need to know the real time trends and the potential issues which are coming on the table to take those quick decisions around so that business intelligence and reporting is important and then the other um, we are a finance people so financial planning and analysis so mm-hmm. that i would say is kind of engraved into our dna <clears throat> and the and the cfo should very rightly focus on these analytical tools providing all financial planning analysis because forecasting is one key which is which is which is actually driving where we are if you if you actually see the i, I would recently quote an example of infosys uh, their forecasting is bad which means they said we see a bad quarter how did the market react so the importance of forecasting becomes very very important and it could be driven by a lot of factors i just gave an example that why forecasting becomes very important to us the third fourth fourth would be mm, let's call it risk management and we as the cfo sits uh, sit a lot on those topics with us and these topics uh, uh, come to our desk every day it could be a credit risk it could be a financial risk it could be a market risk it could be an operational risk and there are there are many facets and colors to to the kind of risk which we which we run through so that should also be one of the focus areas through which these analytics tool we can we can get into some information which is very very real time cost sure. optimization which we saw in your survey everybody everybody gave gave a um, cost high, and efficiency yeah so cost efficiency so cost of so there has to be cost saving opportunities and the kind of period we are into right now uh till the point through this analytics tool we don't get those spending patterns around uh, we are we would not be in a position to identify the inefficiencies around the system or optimizing the processes and there are lots of processes within the system and even outside where our uh, our spending patterns are bad or even the timing of spending is bad so we would need those these analytic tools uh, uh, to to take care of that and last but not the least is the automation uh, and efficiency when i say automation and the efficiency it could be in the finance process 
it could be in the month close or a financial close process or a manual data entry and i can tell you with my example in our in our company that we have automated so much that we have stopped doing a manual data entry and there are processes and tools which we have brought in i'll give you one example say for example we have an amc contract with the customer we invoice that we receive that payment every month you have to pass an accrual entry so you don't need to do that the mm. tool the, uh, the analytics tool will do that for you automatically this is just one of an example so all i would say and sum up is that overall a cfo should use the analytics to help a data driven decision making improve financial performance and identify the new opportunities for growth so so interesting thanks thanks so much uh, nipun i think that was interesting dev i want to come to you next you know it's a slightly uh, controversial question but i think nevertheless uh, needs to uh, get asked uh, you know whose baby is analytics in the organization because we've seen the uh, the cfo's role sort of ever expanding so you're not just looking at finance you're looking at business you're looking at technology and everything else sustainability and so many others right so as a finance leader obviously you are facilitating analytics within the organization but who does it belong to and this question is very important for the for the simple reason that you know an organization embarks on multiple initiatives and if there is no custodian or champion uh, that is responsible for driving this effectively in the organization the transformation exercise sort of fizzles out right so they give us your experience and uh, what do you think uh, you know works so i think let's split your question up there are two questions you know seema and i'll just first pick the first one first that who owns the analytics okay in the organization so so if i see let me break uh, you know this to in the evolution of analytics let's split it into three phases or three eras you can say one is if you can consider that okay 2000 and prior to 2000 which is a early penetration of computers you can say okay Uh, and the second era you can say that okay next 12 years typically when the early adoption of it systems okay and the third phase you can say that 2020 12 onward when you know it is more interface based it platform era okay so now coming to the first one which is like 2000 and prior to 2000 uh, in the when the computers were you know very less number of computers were seen it was basically if you see you know we for all uh, you no know, legitimate purpose we used to say that okay finance is owning the data then but literally meaning if you see there is to be a computer operator okay mm. to own those data and typically yeah. the data used to get digitalized from a hard copy to a soft copy okay right. the computers were been used as a repository okay so typically you know it was like very less analytics from you know the systems or the tools but it was more you can say you know experience based you know analysis used to happen yeah uh, but for all you know literal purpose it was finance who used to own those data the repository you can say rather than analytics now come to the second phase you know where you know not 2000 to 2012 when the erp systems the early you know adoption of the systems came into place then the wider systems came where a lot of data which is beyond a financial basic finance data used to get stored in a system at the get, that get registered in a system so now finance again because it was more but it was more restricted in the financial area only the transactional data and all those things so again finance become a owner of that one okay but it was very much restricted to all financial data by that time so this was a phase you can say that okay when you go to a bank you know for an account opening you will always get you no know, you can expect that okay somebody will offer you a very good coffee with you no know, maybe that okay you can get some you know cookies also along with that one now come to the third phase you know which is 2012 onward okay it is the same bank where you know it is more interface data it platforms are evolved by this time and you are going to a bank account now you have to open a bank account you can still having a coffee and a few cookies but this time the you may have to pay your own okay and you are not <laughs> in a bank you are sitting in a coffee shop and no and you are using your you know handle device to open your bank account right but this is the phase where if you see normally we see that you know there is in operation we see that okay where it is a 
you know backward integration forward integration you know when it came to this phase in data it becomes multiple integration it is backward forward lateral integration everything happened correct so for the first time we we you know in financials we used to keep from invoicing the data used to come to people mm. correct yeah. now if see it was sales order prior to that one it is lead management okay from a salesforce.com or from somewhere it is the lead which used to come okay it is all backward and from the forward side you can say that okay when i am selling to my distributor or dealer or my customer whom he is selling okay and what price he is selling which district he is selling how many inventory he is carrying from a simple distributor management system this data is also coming and now you come to the lateral side okay your supply chain you have given it to a 3pl 4pl who is again managing with a you know wms or a you know warehouse management system or a transport management system and various other things correct now and while these things are happening you have social media where there is a consumer at any point of time is giving a feedback okay mm. there is a survey ongoing there is a marketing survey ongoing now when it so many things are happening around now i think finance has raised its hand saying that no more it is our core competency right mm-hmm. it is not our expertise now okay so so far finance is to be owning the analytics now it is going beyond our control and now we look forward they're saying that okay there is a market here who has to own there is a supply chain who has to own their data there is a sales team who has to own their data okay we will okay finance is very nicely positioned in an organization but right? you see that okay what's happening around where you are investing what is your priority okay so you can utilize those data you should and we know that okay what data is available where but utilizing the entire analytics becomes very difficult right. now come to the second question that what should happen then okay with this transition seema i feel that i think it's the time to adopt the new cxo Yeah. okay so far the cxos are like ceo cfo cio chro uh, now we should see that okay if somebody you know like we need to create a very specific cxo who will be like who should be called like a you know chief analytics officer or chief data officer okay or yeah. digital officer who will be very different from a cio normally we see that okay when it is in chief information officer in you no know, who is really looking into the it infrastructures and the tools and the safety and the administration of those side the chief digital officer is somebody to whom whom who should have a governance around the data mm. okay, who can really manage the which platforms and how much data we need to keep and how to utilize those data maybe finance can be a customer for them the yeah. best part what do you know in my view this function will never be a cost center Mm-hmm. that if you know i think is a huge profit center going forward so that's what the organization should look forward right no so it's interesting dev because like you rightly said i think you know in a lot of progressive organizations there are chief uh, uh, data officers or chief analytics officers who've been uh, who've been just bought in to manage this whole analytics piece and uh, such an uh, if i'd like you to just uh, you know pitch in here what's been your experience do you think that there are you know specialist custodians uh, within organizations who are owning the analytics function or what does the structure look like see there's a mix of what we've seen but i fully agree with uh, mr dev that See, we're looking at data democratization that's happening now. Right. right? Whereas right. earlier used to be, you know, under the purview of by force or by design with mm-hmm. the finance function. Yeah. Uh, now it has come to a point wherein data democratization is something that's very seriously being followed in a lot of organizations, especially in the progressive ones, because yeah. they recognize that everybody has a stake. Everybody needs to do analytics. Yes. It shouldn't be under the purview of a chosen few. right so right towards that so that's generally been the trend that we've seen uh of course you know if you give you know it's like um, this is old adage they say that if you give a thousand monkeys a thousand typewriters in a thousand days they'll give you the complete works of shakespeare <laughs> you don't want to really do that do we right so, right so then you do need a leader okay that's where you do need a leader who will coordinate that activity in the say but he won't be the one driving that you know this is the kind of analytics you need to do the people decide what the what analytics they need to do he's an enabler right right so whether it's the coe 
okay which handles this or if it's or, or you have a, a full time position like a cdao or a cao and so on uh, they become in a different names but right. their job is all the same to promote and to uh, facilitate the analytics journey for an organization towards democratization from the current, uh, you know feudalized feudal uh, setup that we have right right, right. Yeah. interesting uh, prasad i want your quick point here you know we're talking about uh, sachin has been evangelizing democratization in some sense saying that that's the yeah. most more effective model of of sort of managing now each option that you choose whether it's the feudalistic approach or democratization i think each one comes with its with its own challenges so uh, what do you think are some of the challenges when you sort of democratization uh, when you're looking at democratizing data and analytics and uh, how do you sort of overcome some of these challenges sure so uh, let's kind of uh, just see on the kind of throw some light on the uh, data democratization basically so as sachin and others mentioned that data and analytics are kind of purely driven by the needs of an organizations and maybe to certain uh, to some extent uh, even the regulations requirement uh, under which the organization is working on and there are various departments within the organization which are kind of involved in maintenance of the data and analytics uh, reporting uh which they use for the business purpose and and there are several systems within the uh, say organization say finance may use uh financial systems like say sap or oracle or, uh, hr may use some of the hr system say for example workday or maybe a sales team would be using some other uh, systems for say salesforce etc so various departments using different uh, systems whereas finance is uh, one uh which actually needs access to most of these systems to perform the function effectively mm -hmm. so uh even even say within a finance there could be a lot of systems which the finance teams required maybe starting from say procurement uh, or treasury management or even fpnd operational analytics revenue analytics tax systems um or even from the billing and accounting and reporting systems etc so there are various systems which are kind of um, uh, which is which are required to effective functioning of an organization so therefore uh, the data migration and at the same time ensuring the agility is kind of very critical so some of the top major concerns which are kind of generally which we have observed or come across is like uh, various systems are there in place but they are not integrated effectively and they are not talking to each other that is one of the major uh, issues what we have seen and then there are a lot of duplicate reports which are kind of available so different uh, uh departments uses different reports but the outcome is actually the different so the those reports are not matching a lot of times and effort is spent on manually on reconciling those uh because those are giving different outputs uh many employees are kind of not even aware of what all systems the organization have mm. what are the analytics capabilities those systems have and how it will actually help them improve their job so um so all these uh, some uh, are the some of the major challenges which uh, we face and uh, that's where uh, what uh, uh, i think whatever the name we can give it but uh, say cio department for example uh, which cfo uh, has to have a separate uh, uh, team cio team which in turn needs to work with several departments and especially within finance internal control systems as well as the business finance team because business finance teams are more closer to the business who understands the business requirements uh, and at the same time internal control systems team can actually puts the checks and balances and do the risk management and through all this collaborative efforts cio team actually within cfo has to kind of drive this system implementation upgradation mm -hmm. integrations uh, reports which uh, needs to be generated which are the kind of uh, and how these op we can utilize these systems optimally uh, exist there are a lot of existing systems 
uh, how to utilize it uh, optimally is very critical. And um, this, there, it can also be tackled through a kind of systematic approach uh, in defining the roles and responsibilities of uh, each and every employee in, uh, not each and every employee, but I would say uh, at each and every level uh, mm. within each and every department so that uh, that will help actually uh, mapping the uh, the access mapping and what are the, uh, the analytics tools which the individual would need and uh, educating empl employees on again not only about the systems but um, how how they can actually um, utilize it better uh, uh, they can take the responsibility of the data management, etc. So that is something uh, uh, that culture needs to be built in within the organization. Right, right. Great. I think that's a great input, uh, Prasad. Before we go to Manish, I wanted to take another quick poll uh, so that we we tackle this issue effectively before we move on to the next part. So what are some of the most significant challenges that hinder the proper utilization of analytics? And we have a connected question here, which which is going to uh, Manish. So I just request you all to take this poll very quickly, 30 seconds. So please key in your responses quickly. Okay, we'll end the poll here. Um, okay, very interesting. I think two, two uh, or three big challenges that uh, that uh, you know our audience has said is poor data quality, which I think uh, even Nipun had sort of raised in his initial comments. Getting the getting the data right. Uh, second aspect is difficulty in finding and accessing relevant data. And the uh, third huge aspect is inability to effectively analyze and interpret data insights. I think, uh, Manish, I want to, you know, get in your point of view here. I think, you know, a couple of these pointers really uh, root to an aspect of finding the right kind of skills uh, to be able to leverage analytics within the organization very effectively. So as the sophistication of tools increase, I think the availability of that talent who can appropriately leverage uh, the power of, uh, you know, say analytics or automation within that organization, it's imperative that organization source and attract uh, uh, these kind of skills and also retain them. So Manish, give us your perspective on, you know, how can you sort of attract, develop and retain uh, finance talent uh, who have the skills to leverage uh, analytics and also create a culture of continuous learning and development uh, in that sense. <clears throat> Thanks, Sima, for the question. And uh, just to answer this question, yes, CFO plays very important role in attracting, developing and retaining the top finance talent. And uh, of course, the people has been considered as a most valuable asset and very difficult task mm. in their top financial talent. Right. I think for my perspective, mindset of CFO is to be decided here. The CFO has to some kind of the mindset and he should be involved, first of all, in setting a clear vision for the autonomous finance, mm -hmm. advanced analytic capabilities. So there are some financial outcomes can come and so can be achieved successfully. And also very important point is since it's a teamwork, so upskilling of the team, especially finance team is very important here. Like workforce planning to identify the talents, who are the talents within your team, ensuring the right mix of the skills. If the team is there, various digital uh, persons are there, what is the skills they are having? Most important, balancing the technical expertise with the business interpretation expertise. Because in your team, there are two kinds of the people. One are a bit orthodox. They are good in business interpretation. Some of right. the digital ones. So a coordination between the both becomes very important and both should be on the same page. And an environment has to be created where an entire team can trust on the technology, exploring the algorithmic decision making or whatever data says. One should trust on it. Yes, whatever data is saying, we should trust on it. We should move ahead for the purpose of the, uh, making the decisions. Also, project management expertise is also very necessary if successful transformation is to be done. 
certain more things are required number one uh, if i talk about in any organization certain processes are coming since beginning and mm-hmm. they are because these are continuing for last uh, several years so as a cfo one should identify in the finance what are the uh, what are the processes which are no longer in use and mm-hmm. what they should be taken into the place in the new era of the digitalization or intelligent analysis mm-hmm. or important seeking out and rewarding the competencies for innovation risk taking iteration apply in applying intelligent analytics now question comes here what are the competencies which are required so in my opinion there are two four or five competencies are there for example technology literacy it means ability to exploit the digital technology to drive better outcomes for the finance and business so that it can add the value to the business and for the growth both secondly digital translation it means Uh, explaining the digital technology by interacting with the stakeholders most important whatever data is coming and whatever it is saying you should present the data to the stakeholder with your decision key yes this is the data this is the thing and these steps are required to be taken as per our industry analytics and it should be convinced because of that one third thing if i talk about digital learning means if there is a some platform one should accept the platform very quickly and easily number 4 i think sachin rightly said digital bias management suppose data is coming we have interpreted the data and the result are such which is beyond the logics of the business then again it has to be checked verified before implementing any decision and lastly data ambition means willing to accept that one mm-hmm. so role of the cfo becomes very very important here and the cfo for the purpose of the team building has to see that digital finance team always goes beyond their daily work so a work balance of those team has to be maintained in order to avoid any work like any burnout because work life balance becomes very important secondly digital finance talent likes to work as per their own time so if by the mk no in 3 hours i want this data impossible because they will it's a totally creative work they will analyze data in various ways then we will they will come to the conclusion they then will present the data so a flexibility should be provided as a cfo to the entire team okay you do work what are the implications there please come across discuss many times as much as you want etc etc and also digital finance team when uh, they are deriving the some results they would like to share the results with the all the stakeholders maybe of the finance or even beyond finance both mm-hmm. the certain data is of such kind where you cannot decide who is the owner of the data the finance we the finance the purchase the sales because the finance is interlinked with all the departments put together it may be so a platform has to be created by the cfo where all the business interpreters and that and digital uh, team can sit together and they can come to the conclusion and everybody can accept and they are come on the same page and lastly digital finance team generally the younger people they are very much uh, think about their finance they are very much concerned about their career in comparison to the orthodox uh, interpretation business interpretation so they should have some career aspirations within the finance the cfo should see their career aspirations they should uh, provide the some assurance that yes you will be uh, if you stay here you will be uh, better opportunities here etc etc so in my opinion i just sum up hiring of the right people with a certain competencies proper mixing of the domain and digital analytic staff develop the competency by way of trainings and motivations sharing the organization specific knowledge this is very important because industry specific knowledge is quite okay mm. the organization specific knowledge with the data team and giving the proper environment and work culture keeping flexible timings creating platform to provide ease and interaction with this other stakeholders addressing their concern uh, of the digital team is becomes very important and taking care of their growth and position and rewards so this is in my opinion how we can handle the intelligent analytics team as well very interesting uh, uh thanks for those inputs uh nipun i want to go back to you you know one of the aspects that uh, that was highlighted in the poll that we that we did was one of the imperatives for uh, for uh, driving the intelligence uh, analytics agenda within the organization was ease of collaboration with the other uh, departments right and so tell us a little bit about how finance is collaborating with other departments to identify new opportunities for using a advanced analytics and also improving operational efficiencies i think this is this is what you're supposed to do this is desirous but i'm sure there must be challenges 
associated with this as well. And so, Nipun, how have you sort of navigated That's some of the challenges? Point, uh, uh, Seema. And doing that is like doing any big project which we have. <laughs> and it is like a I agree. I agree. And I can tell you with my experience, it looks easy on the paper, but then right. uh, when you're getting onto the ground, yeah. as you say, uh, only the wearer of the shoe know where it is. <laughs> so, so uh, first thing first is that you need to have a cross-functional team. Otherwise, you cannot right. survive. And that once you're doing that analysis, that cross-functional team can be from IT, business, analytics, as a and Manish also mentioned that how we can pick those up and then uh, listen to them with an open mind because everybody comes with a different insight and a perspective and it's there when you identify those opportunities coming onto the table. Right. Uh, second would be um, identify the business opportunities on the table and those business opportunities have to be in line with your strategic objective. See, you just cannot go out of that scope just because you need to do some kind of an automation. It has to be in line with the company's strategic objectives and a collaboration with the top business leader is also at most important. I have seen there are there, there comes a resistance. We sit at certain positions, but then that, that also needs to be aligned. Right. Uh, data we talked of, uh, Sachin talked, Dave talked, me talked, and yeah. we also talked of the data quality. Uh, I think the third is assess the availability of the data. When I say the data availability, it's quality as well. And I've been harping that every now and then that uh, I'll use that word again, data silos still exist in our systems. Mm -hmm. And uh, and you said that there are challenges. I can tell you the challenges are so different that there are companies which have migrated from different. I can tell you Nokia has come up uh, from a couple of companies together and we have a lot of the system sitting into into our place and where we have data coming in different formats, different tables, et cetera, et cetera. And data becomes the biggest of all challenge, data privacy. And I will touch on that when you said, what are the data challenges and how we come upon that? We'll not touch that topic here. Once we are there, once we have identified the team objectives, then there has to be a clear roadmap. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going how we do a project. So when I say a clear roadmap, outline the steps needed to achieve the desired objective this is this is one thing key which we usually miss while we are designing any object with us so kindly outline what is your objective timelines kpi and the milestones is as is of the key importance to any kind of an objective and then we are the finance guys so we know we we believe in the governance so there has to be one some governance process around it yeah. could be in any shape and form it could be in form of the policies, procedures, it could be in form of a SOX control, it could be in form of security compliances, but the governance mechanism has to be there in place. And this is all with the agreement of all the all. And last but not the least, uh, I think my colleagues have already shared, Prashad, Dev and Manish also tied up on that, foster a culture of data-driven decision-making, which is the change in the mindset. Mm -hmm. We might have moved along, but that mindset mindset still stays. And Manish was very rightly saying that the training is equally important. So I would say training of those employees. And I can tell you with the mindset of the people whom I interact, they say, if this gets automated, what will we do? Mm -hmm. What will we do means that you train yourself, you upskill yourself. So we use the word upskill. So that right. upskill has to come. So overall, it is, it is a collaboration, communication, focus on the business objectives, and that is the key to identify the new opportunities. Now coming right. up with the challenge, two minutes more, data silos, as I said, different format, uh, data privacy issues, data security issues, technical expertise would be one which Manish also uh, picked up so we can upskill the people and the organization culture. So I would just broadly classify into these three categories and which mm -hmm. I have touched, uh, what I discussed with you. No, interesting, Nipun. Thanks, thanks for reiterating some of those uh, challenges. Uh, Dev, I want to come to you quickly. You know, we are using intelligent analytics to be able to do effective scenario planning, right? Uh, especially at a time when when there is so much of volatility in the uh, in the external environment. How do you quickly plan, remain agile, and are responding to to conditions to the external conditions? So, what are some of the best practices? Uh, in your mind for developing contingency plans that are that are informed by data driven uh, insights well uh, so sima coming to you no know, now let me just highlight what i said in the past saying that okay we have a 
backward forward lateral integration of data which happened okay in last 10 12 years which we are seeing mm-hmm. uh, that has certainly helped you know um, as a finance person sitting where i am sitting definitely i am a better off than my predecessor who was 10 years before me because you no know, earlier somebody used to start from a order book okay and what's happening in the factory what is the cost this is that you have a very you know everything is visible to him by which he has to make a financial planning now as many of my you know colleagues mentioned here that today nobody would like to have a surprise okay whether be it customer be it your employees be it your you know stakeholders nobody likes a surprise everybody would like to have a pleasant surprise to some extent but you no know, if it is too pleasant also people would like to take <laughs> a pinch of salt right okay. so now what happens actually definitely when you have so much of data you are in a better position to do a better forecasting or planning now the thing is that if you have not planned or not kept the data in proper buckets then i don't think it is easier to you know you know use or you know put a proper analytics to those data okay so you know for example you know if you see a, any of the fmcg or food you no know, food ingredients manufacturing companies a dabar or a nestle at any point of time they have they are using thousands and thousands of ingredients okay mm. and there is a specific bill of material used for each of their products now you imagine that okay every commodity or every ingredient is going in its own direction right okay i can also see that okay similar maybe the life of manish here okay <laughs> so when every commodity and every component goes in its you know in own direction and you are sitting in a place and forecasting for a one year six months or you no know, three months horizon uh, it's very difficult for a humanly impossible for a finance person to say that okay which which all things i'll do mm. now you can see all these things are in the system now what we can do and what i can foresee today we pick only that top 10 top 15 commodities and we predict that okay what is the visibility for those commodities to go up for example in my role you now today i see that okay helium is one of the natural gas which you no know, which is a main component used in an mri machine okay and because of the world you know the world outside there is a constraint or there, there is a limitation sudden limitation and you no know, suddenly one point of time we feel felt that okay maybe the thousands of mri working around may have to go for a stoppage okay mm-hmm. now the top 5 top 10 items you can you know humanly monitor or administer which direction those are going now if you see that okay there, there are thousands of commodities then you need a system to come in and do that one for us and it is very much as a bill of material is in the system right the bill of material is in the system how much quantity you need that is in the system how what is your visit what is your you know uh, planning for the coming period of 3 months 6 months 1 year output that also in your you know that you know now somebody has to really see that okay there is a component which is 2% or 3% of your cost and how that is going to go up or go down from an expert who is beyond your organization okay mm. the system can marry both this data then you see your life of a finance person which is more or less like 60 70% sorted right? remaining 30 40% nobody knows Right, so right, right. In the world, right. So that's what I feel that okay, life will be much better whether none of the problems will be there. I don't think so. There will be new problems which will come there because our competition also will see those data. Yeah, yeah. That data, but at least we'll come out. We'll at least work to a great extent. Sure, sure. No, that's that's an interesting input, and uh, um, you know, I want to go to Prasad very quickly. Prasad, I think. all of our panelists have talked about governance right governance being very very uh, important so so tell us a little bit about what are some of the effective uh, governance structures that cfos can put in place to ensure that the data is used responsibly and effectively within the finance function and uh, you know yeah. while you're while you're still allowing democratization of data and analytics within the uh, system yes yes sure so um actually 
is CFO's responsibility to ensure that okay, internal control systems is in place. So indirectly, data governance structure is a major part of that, and uh, it is you know, CFO's responsibility to drive it. At the same time, the CFO's responsibility is to drive the uh, efficiency in the organization, just which will help in improving the revenue and profitability. So uh, making available the relevant data to uh, each and every uh, person to uh, ensure that they perform effectively so there is a kind of balance which uh, needs to be uh, which is kind of required um so while um, as i mentioned earlier the cio team can drive with the, maybe with the help of intercontrol management team and say business cross team and other various departments in terms of uh, determining what are the uh, roles and responsibilities of at uh, various uh, team members and providing the accesses etc so uh, coming to within finance uh, functions especially when you, uh, you mentioned so uh, we need to see okay what accesses are required from the data accessible perspective and analytics perspective so, for example, a procurement team uh, should not ideally have an access to the banking system, uh, whereas, say, AP team who is making the payment should not actually be able to raise the uh, PO or create a vendor and things like that. So, those kind of checks and balances would be required. Whereas, be it procurement team, uh, AP, uh, AP team, or treasury team, these needs to have an access to okay, the cash management. So basically, yeah. procurement teams needs to plan their uh, uh, the procurement of services and um, goods. Similarly, AP team has to kind of needs to have an access to open PO reports and um, do the fund management. Uh, treasury team also needs to see okay, what the excess funds which is kind of lying or there's a shortage of funds which it has to kind of work on. So there is a information flow which is required. Though the systems needs to be the access to the systems. Uh, for entering the data or um, taking some of the data out, uh, that needs to be kind of controlled effectively. And so uh, also uh, there are a lot of other checks and balances would be required in terms of say if employee uh, leaves or changes the rules, then the, uh, appropriately those accesses should be deactivated or be changed. Uh, to a certain extent, frequent review would be required on uh, any additional integration would be required on the systems uh, to or uh, trainings would be required from the data uh, to understand the to make uh, employee understand the importance of the data and uh, analytics of the to the organizations or data protection as such. Um, even if when the integration is required from uh, uh, organization systems with the third party service providers, mm. in that actually the kind of special uh, checks and balances review process is required, approval process is required, but that is something which is like imperative for the driving the business growth and which is very much required. So we need to kind of put on checks and balances. At the same time, we need to kind of focus on uh, making the relevant data available and uh, uh, ensuring the data management properly. No, absolutely. I think that's that's a very interesting input around around governance. Uh, let's take a quick poll while uh, you know while we ask Madish for uh, for his response on an aspect. Uh, I'll just activate the poll first and then go to Madish quickly. Okay, so while you're responding to this to this poll, uh, Manish, I wanted to quickly check with you and get your input on, you know, we've talked about internal collaboration and how that can get facilitated, uh, some of the checks and balances that you need to have in place. How can you, uh, how can you perhaps look at, you know, CFOs collaborating with their external partners? So the, the external ecosystem that you have of uh, partners, suppliers, uh, et cetera. How, how would you look at, you know, analytics sort of impacting those, uh, those relationships? And what are some of the key considerations uh, that one needs to bear in mind, uh, you know, from an analytics standpoint? How do you measure the impact of these, uh, these relationships, et cetera? So uh, would you be able to just give us a quick point of view on that? Sure. Uh, thanks, Ivan. Very big. Actually, it's a very, it's a question with a very big answer. <laughs> <laughs> Picked up <laughs> anyhow. So first of all, what I think is sometimes it's very necessary to take the opinion of the third party or, yeah. an, expert, or an expert. And uh, it's very necessary to select a proper expert for this purpose because you will have so many experts in the market. Every expert will be having a knowledge, industry specific knowledge, but an expert who can understand your requirement, who yeah. can 
understand the information related to your organization will serve the purpose first number 2 how much he is charging whether he is doing only analytics or he is providing any solution means any software or any something mini erp or whatever it may be if he is providing the erp what is the cost since we are working with the amul dairy and uh, we work on very thin margins and uh, with little uh, big volumes and uh, we do not accumulate the profit we used to distribute the profit to the farmers during the financial year itself and secondly what we pay to our owners is not their return on investment it's basically their livelihood mm. it was very difficult for us to select the expert the selection is okay but we have to define first of all what are the commercials and what will be the outcome and whether it will be a fruitful or not all these things has to be taken care of number one number two suppose you have selected the expert and you have imparted entire knowledge to him multiple rounds of the meetings has to be done with the expert and you need to take the reverse demo from them ki yes what exactly you have understood just tell us what you have understood what we are going to do this is our requirement so this is how an uh, expert has to be selected Examples. Yes, we are having two or three examples within my organization itself. Since we are collecting the milk, and milk is over sixty-five uh, percent cost of entire raw material. It's a milk only where we get the fat and SNF, and because of that, we get the various materials manufactured and sell into the market. So, well, approximately six lakh farmers are the pouring the milk on daily basis twice daily, and we are having a system in the name of the AMCS. and it's a basically mini erp where entire data is punched mm. a farmer comes to the village society it just pour the milk a sample is taken and after that ft machine takes the readings of the fat and as and automatically it is pushed to the system and everything is available dashboard survey everything is available now where intelligent analytics is work here suppose a particular farmer who is pouring the milk at the rate of 5% of the fat every day approximately 0.2 0.2% here and there All of a sudden, if suppose he is pouring the milk at that level, six percent of the fat. Now the question comes in: It's a trigger point. How? Either this increasing of the cattle or something else, filtration mm. or maybe anything else. So this kind of system should work when we are working, talking about the dairies because it's very because with the brand name of the Amul, we cannot take this kind of the uh, milk at all. Number one. Number two. Since we are making the payment to six lakh farmers, we need to make the payment to them in every seventh or tenth day. Out of Gujarat, we are making the payment directly into the bank account of the farmer in every seventh day. For that, first a robust system is required. You know, mm. The collection. This is the average milk. Uh, suppose there is a sudden jump in a milk. The reasons are identified, and after that, we are taking the direct Excel sheets or whatever reports from there. We are uploading that one to the banking platform, and automatically, without any manual information, the payment is done in one shot, and within that time itself. Number two, suppose we are analyzing the report over there. Suppose in a particular village, because Gujarat is divided into various villages, and in a particular village, the milk procurement is uh, fall down suddenly. Now, need to identify what what is the reason. Mm. If we are having our veterinary team in place, three hundred or four hundred veterinary doctors are there to take care of the cattle of the farmer, and they are working on the field on twenty four by seven basis. For that purpose, we are having a separate application where the third party integration is there. and any farmer who want a service of a veterinarian he simply either make a call to the call center or nowadays we prefer ki just book the call on the app itself then app automatically divert the call to a particular doctor, doctor who is a vicinity of the area who reach there and who just treat the cattle like that and we are having that data also ki okay what kind of diseases are there because he note down all the diseases in his prescription he note down all the medicines over there Suppose on the one hand I came to know that yes the milk is quite less here. I will compare in that particular village whether the number of visits for those doctors have been increased or not. If increased, what kind of disease were there? Whether those diseases impacts on the milk or not? Mm -hmm. But so being a CFO because being a CFO it's my duty I can say to take care of if whether I'm getting the proper revenue or not. And how will I get proper revenue when automatically uh, I can say uh, production will be and sale will be up to mark. and production will be optimal only when we will get the proper milk okay so by this way various models can be prepared these are just two examples of sure sure absolutely and uh, how can you measure the impact number one uh, suppose i am getting a milk of the good quality it will reduce my cost in second time before using the app there was a lot of uh, cost was involved in the transportation to the doctor from uh, center to farmer place and farmer place to center once we implemented the app 
after that what happened the uh, kilometers between the two visits were reduced drastically and lot mm-hmm. of things were done in terms of transportation secondly when doctor was there entire history of the animal is there yes mm-hmm. was the animal fall ill what was the reasons and entire medication is also available on the uh, on the history and he can immediately decide ki which uh, medicine should be required to be given so all these are the parameters by which we can develop uh, partnerships with the external because both the softwares are developed with the external partners on practical example and uh, yeah. the entire uh, this software has to be upgraded as per need basis because it's right. a day job once accumulation of data then interpretation of the data further accumulation of the data further interpretation of data and so on and it's a never ending process mm. by this way the ceo can can collaborate with the external partners and value to the organization in terms of the data accumulation as well as decision making thank you no very interesting uh, manish okay so i think we time to i mean maybe we have a minute to sort of wrap up and uh, sachin i wanted to get your quick comments on you know you've heard our panel you've heard uh, you know how they are going about uh, navigating some of the challenges or implementing uh, intelligent analytics uh, within their organization so uh, a first i'd like you to quickly respond to how does one measure these outcomes and see if you know and transformation exercise is working secondly what would be your uh, advice to cfos who are sort of getting started on that journey given your uh, you know voluminous experience engaging with uh, cfos across uh, apac so uh see what to answer your first question see like any other uh, you know measurement is always subjective okay the idea here is that um, you have a business that business has certain kpis those kpis are what you are monitoring and the moment you see an improvement in those kpis your first thought is that how do i attribute what do i attribute this success to okay what actually had a positive impact upon it what had a negative impact on this um it's not an absolute science it's not pure mathematics at this time because there just so many factors uh, that interplay uh, you know on your day to day business and you can't really say that okay this particular initiative can take all of the credit but what can happen however is that uh, what you have to understand also is that analytics is not uh, you know an instant solution it's not a magic bullet okay it sometimes takes a little bit of time before it gets into the dna of the organization and then you start seeing improvement over a period of time so you need to give it that amount of time that's the first thing so your period of measurement of the success of that initiative has to be longer than uh, what you're traditionally used to you can't simply say all right uh, if the improvement has happened in this quarter and this is a quarter in which i did the initiative i implemented some ai ml uh, analytics uh, uh, platforms etc i should immediately see an impact no that's not true that's not how it works okay so that's the first thing that we have to do uh what we've typically seen in most organizations is they give it uh from something like about 6 to 8 months all right to be able to really really measure the impact of this and in that time it's they have multiple programs okay so for example uh, i'm we may have uh, as in terms of you may prioritize certain areas and the kpis are then de- determined beforehand as so these are the kpis for that particular areas effectiveness and now i'm going to see what are things that i can do using the ami platform to be able to improve upon that a simple example could be let's say we're trying to streamline the financial close process or okay, the financial consolidation process if it's something that typically takes uh you know n number of days let's say it's a double digit let's say it's about 15 days right now and you now want to try and see how do i curtail it how do i bring it down to a single digit okay so over a period of time now you this is not something that'll happen in one cycle it's something that will take mm-hmm. improvement one after the other by by uh, you're tackling various obstacles that you have on the way to be able to achieve that objective so you have to keep monitoring those kpis and have a concerted effort on continuously trying to improve that process using the AMI, AI ML platform so like i said it's not exact science there are a number of different parameters in place sometimes you'll have to use a proxy for the actual kpi sometimes you can use a direct kpi so there's no clear cut method as of right now to answer the second question that what are the uh, key factors to keep in mind uh, you know when you're trying to achieve digital transformation Uh, i think it was quite apparent in some of the poll questions in fact was that the first thing was 
completeness of data. Okay, and as uh, Nipun also mentioned, unlocking the silos. Right, that's the first step that you need to get to. You have to unlock those silos. Otherwise, there's really no point in continuing with this uh, with the journey. And when you once you unlock those silos, that's when all of these opportunities suddenly open up. If you find, if uh, if you've always been dealing with you know one predominant source of data, let's say it's your ERP, which is typically the most uh, voluminous of data, but then you suddenly realize you know I also have a data management system, I also have an HRMS, I also have an SFDC, I also have any other CRM solution or any operational system, and now I can actually find a means or a platform on which I can stitch all of this together and be able to derive insights across all of these domains then it suddenly starts becoming you know the kind of intelligent analytics that you want to look for so what that means is first step unlock the silos second is analyze at scale okay we're not talking about those small pieces that you're typically used to all right you know let me automate a particular report no we're talking about automating the kpis across an entire business and doing it at scale which means I might be looking through terabytes of data, deriving insights out of that, and that should be the target. Uh, earlier, it used to be a bottleneck because we didn't have the tools, we didn't have the infrastructure to do that. Okay, But now it's become easier because infrastructure is readily available. You've got cloud, so you've got tools which help you do that uh, without having to be a, you know, a, a data scientist or being adept at coding you've got no code low code environments now which allow you to do that just by dragging and dropping so those are the kind of things that are at your disposal now to be able to do that kind of analysis so those two things are the, uh, the key criteria for being able to uh, you know get a digital transformation in place uh, a digital analytics transformation in place which is unlocking silos and analyze at scale wow interesting thanks so much uh, sachin i think that was great for you to sum up that and uh, you know it's uh, it's time for us to wrap up we've, we've already exceeded by about five six minutes but a big thank you to our uh, speakers Dave, Prasad, Nipun, Manish, uh, Sachin and of course our wonderful audience listening in to us. Uh, I hope you found the session useful and feel free to write in to us. I'd be happy to channelize your questions to uh, any of our panelists and they would be more than happy to respond to you. So with that, we will end today's webinar and thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.